Good morning and welcome to St Bartholomew's Church. So sad that we can't be together in the building uh, worshipping God together, but we're so grateful that we're able at least to meet in this way virtually uh, via YouTube where we can bring our Uh, know that together we are gathered before his throne in worship. Just as we start our service, I wanted to read uh, from Psalm 93. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty. Firm and secure. Your throne was established. The seas have lifted up, Lord, the seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves, mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. No matter how tumultuous events in the creation around us might be, the Lord stands firm. His voice is louder than the sound of the raging seas. His goodness is greater than the dangers and evils of a pandemic uh, that spreads its tentacles around the whole world. As we begin our service together, let's join in uh, with all creation, praising God for his goodness, all creatures of our God and King.
the Lord be with you and also with you. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Collect for today. Almighty God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace. And in the renewal of our lives make known your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Well, we've begun our service acknowledging the glory and the greatness of God. Uh, and the truth is that we know that we frequently fall short of his glory and his goodness. Uh, and so it is an entirely rational thing as we begin our service to come to him and confess the truth that he already knows, trusting completely in his mercy and goodness for us. Here's a verse from uh, the first letter from the Apostle John. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us confess our sins in penitence and faith. Together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from 1 Samuel, and it's read for us by Harriet Tucker. The first reading is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 3, starting at verse 1. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days the word of the Lord was rare, there were not many visions. One night Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am, and he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called Sam Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realised that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, 
Speak, for your servant is listening. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In a moment, Charlie will bring us our gospel reading, but first we're going to sing together again. Do join in at home. Lord enthroned in heavenly splendour. The second reading this morning is John chapter 1, beginning at verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and, uh, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. And now Charlie is going to preach God's word to us. Thanks, Nick. One of the questions, I guess, um, that the COVID pandemic has raised for lots of people in churches around the country and maybe around the world as well is, I suppose, the question of what it actually means to be a Christian community at a time like this, at a time when we can't meet together. And I think over the past year, we've been so restricted in our ability to gather. At times, we haven't been able to celebrate Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper together. At other times, well, for, for what will be at least a year, I guess, we have been unable to sing God's praise together. Even when we have been able to gather in person, we haven't been able to greet one another, really. It, we've been sort of pushing the rules, I suppose, every time we spoke to people after church or beforehand. It's been a painful and difficult time. And if you look at some of the stats, at least, on church attendance and church engagement over the past year, they don't look very good. It looks like people have <laughs> faced the toll of not being able to meet, and it's it's been heavy for them. Some people have, have left church altogether. So what does it mean to really engage with God as a Christian community when we're unable to gather in person. I think our gospel reading this morning might have something to say to that. In the Gospel of John, there are two themes which emerge very early on in the gospel. The first is the idea of being a witness in um, John chapter one, before the, the part I just read for us. We meet John the Baptist, who is like the kind of typical, stereotypical, the paradigm of a witness, someone who points other people to Jesus Christ. John, the writer, seems to give John the Baptist so much airtime in this, uh, this first chapter because he's sort of saying this is what the whole gospel is about from the very beginning. The whole gospel is like John the Baptist pointing us to Jesus Christ. The other theme, though, is the theme that we see in our reading this morning. The idea of following Jesus individually, and it connects to the idea of being a witness. Really, what's going on in this gospel is John, the writer, is pointing us throughout to Jesus Christ. And the reason he's doing that is he wants each of us, like these first disciples, to come and see what Jesus is about. And then when we've seen, to begin to follow Jesus, engage with Jesus personally. And that means, I think, that... Well, on the one hand, this is something that we can do, even if we're self-isolating, even if over this past year we have never felt more alone. We've never felt more disconnected from other people. The reason that John has is, is written his whole gospel is to connect us with Jesus Christ. He's pointing us to Jesus so we can we can get to know Jesus personally. At the same time, though, there's a bit of a challenge here. And maybe this is one thing that being in lockdown again might do for us. Christianity is a wonderfully corporate thing. God intends for us to be part of communities, part of churches. But if you like, it begins with each one of us individually responding to Jesus Christ, individually encountering him. If you like, we have to step out of the crowd. And consider for ourselves, one by one, each one of us, what it means to follow Jesus Christ, what he's all about, 
what he could mean for our lives today. Now, our reading, John chapter 1, verse 43 to 51, is full, I think, of really good reasons to do that. If you like this, this particular example of, of Nathaniel, who we meet in this reading, he's given to us as, the, as, as an example to follow in many ways. This is what it looks like to engage with Jesus and respond to him. This is why we should do it. But before we get to those good reasons, there is, towards the start of the passage, one thing that might sort of hold us up, one thing that might get in our way and stop us engaging personally. It's in that first response that Nathaniel has to Jesus when he hears about him. I'll read from verse 43. Jesus calls Philip, um, another disciple, to, to, to follow him. And then what does Philip do? Well, in verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about who the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And here's Nathanael's response. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Can anything good come from Nazareth? What seems to be going on here is Nathanael basically has a bit of a kind of eye roll moment. He's almost looking down his nose at Nazareth. Now, we don't know exactly why that is. Probably Nazareth was seen as a bit of a provincial backwater. And um, although Nathaniel himself doesn't come from Jerusalem, the capital, he thinks that where, where he is from, Bethsaida, is a slightly more upmarket place than Nazareth. It would be very dangerous to suggest a kind of contemporary uh, analogue to that. I've heard some people, some people talk about Birmingham in slightly disparaging terms when compared with somewhere like London. Of course, as a Birmingham resident myself, I find that completely unpersuasive. But you get the idea. Someone from one part of the country saying, really, you're from there? You're saying that, that, that that's where the action is? That's what Nathaniel's reaction amounts to. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? In other words, I know what comes from Nazareth, he's sort of implicitly saying. You can't possibly be telling me, Philip, that the answers, the deepest answers to the biggest questions of life, the universe and everything is coming from Nazareth. I, I just can't believe that. Now, it seems to me, as we sort of consider what, how this connects with our lives today, that the, the general tenor of sort of Western attitudes to Christianity attitude to Christianity in, in a place like the United Kingdom is sort of similar to Nathaniel's response. Can anything good come from Nazareth? That sense of we know what Christianity is about. We've tried it. And, well, it hasn't got anything for us. That, it strikes me, it seems to me at least, is a dangerous attitude to have when it comes to Christianity. Because at the, well, at the very least, it's deciding before you've even considered it that it's got nothing for you. Deciding before you've even kind of got into the details of it that you don't need to bother with it. That's, you know, imagine if you'd, you'd lost your car keys and you said, I, I definitely know that they're, they're not in my jacket pocket. And so you search everywhere else. And of course you find them in the jacket pocket, the one place where you were sure you wouldn't find anything is where you find it. What if it's that that's the case with Christianity, too, that you, you write off looking into it before you've even started and you miss out? I think this is especially important because one of the things about Christianity, one of the things that, that I think was sort of its genius from the beginning was that it did come from Nazareth. In other words, the Christian idea, what Christianity is all about, is God coming to work through weakness, not coming to the important, the brave, the strong, the powerful, but coming to the unlikely places of the world, coming to the unlikely people. People like Samuel in that first reading we had, a small boy coming to the, the sort of the, the forgotten, the people on the margins. If that's true, if that's what Christianity is, 
then to ignore what we think it is something weak and not very impressive would be to miss out on what God is doing. So that's the, the, the thing that might keep us from engaging personally like Nathaniel does. Can anything good come from Nazareth? But what happens when we do engage? What do we find in Jesus Christ at that kind of personal level when we do start to take him seriously? Nathaniel, I think, gives us at least three things here. The first thing we find of Jesus is that he makes sense of what we already know about the world. As we come to him and listen to him and try to sort of put him into perspective, in the way that we're thinking about life already, what we find is that he connects with what we already know. Now, we see that very clearly for Nathaniel in what Philip says to him when Philip comes and says, yeah, come and meet Jesus. What's Philip's pitch to Nathaniel? It's this. We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, Philip and Nathaniel and, and all the, their friends around in this particular time were Jews. And so they had their Hebrew scriptures where they were reading on a regular basis the promises, the hopes, the expectations of a Messiah, someone coming who would make the world right again. And as they, I suppose, poured over those ancient texts, they'd have been scanning the horizon of their own day thinking, is where is he going to come from? Is he going to is he going to arrive now? Is he going to arrive in our day? And Philip comes to Nathaniel and says, he's arrived. I found him. Come and meet him. Now, we've just seen, haven't we? Now, Nathaniel is skeptical about this claim. But notice he still comes. Philip just says, come and see. And there's something about Nathaniel that says, well, if Jesus could be that longed for Messiah. I'd better check him out. I'd better go and find him. If he if he is that person. That's the how Jesus fits into the Jewish expectations and hopes. And throughout history, many people have found Jesus as that sort of pinnacle, that one in whom all the sort of promises and prophecies of the Hebrew Bible, they all fit together. They found that a compelling reason to take Jesus seriously. And to, to get to know him. But even if it's not that for us individually, there are all kinds of other ways in which, again, historically, people have found Jesus Christ to make sense of, to make the best sense of where they are right now in their lives. So for some people, it might be that Jesus makes sense of the, the direction of history, the course that history has taken. One historian of the early church, Kenneth Scott Latourette, was sort of perplexed by the way that Christianity grew so quickly in the, the early years, the first and second centuries AD. As he looked at it, he saw what it seemed to be a religion that was basically a religion of the weak and the powerless. It didn't have lots of friends in high places, he said. And yet it grew incredibly quickly before it ever got its hands on state power. And as he investigated that and considered it, he came to the conclusion that there must have been, as he puts it, some vast release of energy at the very beginning. He says, without that, the future course that Christianity takes is inexplicable. Now, if you've looked into Christianity, you know that Christianity makes just that claim. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, that vast release of energy out of which explodes the whole movement. Jesus being who he is makes sense of that. Or it might be for other people, perhaps maybe particularly in days like today, there are moments in your life that you struggle to make sense of without Jesus Christ. One example that I came across recently is the poet W.H. Auden. I also found out that he lived for 20 years in Harborn, right next to Harborn Swimming Pool. There's a little blue plaque if you'd like to go and see it. But um, Auden, after he lived in Harborn, he moved over to America in 1939. 
And in part, one of the reasons he did that was to, to escape any threat from the Nazis. Now, he himself at that time was a socialist, an atheist. He was something, as he saw himself, as a sort of left-wing radical. And it, when he'd come to America, he lived in New York. And one evening, he was watching a documentary in the cinema in New York about the, 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 the German troops entering Poland. But as he looked around the cinema, what he saw was most of the German audience in that particular cinema that day cheering on the Nazis, cheering them on as they were killing the Polish people. Auden said this, in two minutes, my whole worldview was turned around. On the one hand, I knew we were evil. As he, as he saw German people cheering on the Nazis, he said, this is a, something about the human race. I knew we were evil. I was looking at something that no psychology, no education, no politics could ever change. But then he also said this, as a European intellectual, I spent all my life removing the absolutes. Everything's relative. But I wanted to say that Hitler was absolutely evil. So I left the cinema a seeker after an unconditional absolute. And I met Christ. As he was confronted in that cinema with radical evil, evil that he couldn't just account for on his sort of previous worldview, he suddenly saw there's something deeper I need. There's someone I need to make sense of what I've just encountered. And in time, he came to see that Jesus Christ was the one who could make sense of it. You could guarantee those absolute good and absolute evil, saying those are real categories. You see the point, then. What happens for Nathaniel as he begins to take Jesus seriously is because Jesus really does make sense of stuff he already had in his, his, his view of the world. In fact, Jesus sort of fits it all together, best of all. That is, has been the experience of people throughout history. On the basis of what we already know, Jesus does make the best sense. Even if it's like with Auden's case, those moments where the reality punctures through and we see something about the world that's true that only Jesus can make sense of. The second thing though, that Nathaniel, I think, shows us that he, he, he sort of embodies for us is the way that as we engage with Jesus Christ, what we find is that he gets to know us. He, he knows us, sorry, at the very depth of our being. It's not just that he makes sense intellectually, that as we encounter him, he sort of he's the jigsaw piece that fits in the puzzle. But like I said at the start, Jesus is about a personal encounter, a personal response that he's seeking from each one of us. And that's what happens to Nathaniel as he's drawn in. Come and see, Philip says so. Nathaniel begins to approach. And what does Jesus say? Verse 47, when Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. And what um, Jesus seems to be saying about Nathaniel there, the, the idea of there is no deceit is about his character. That Nathaniel is, um, maybe you might say, guileless. You know, what you see with him is what you get. As Nathaniel is sort of shocked by this, how, how does he know that that's what I'm like? Jesus goes on, I, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Now, this is, um, I think, really interesting. We, we don't actually really know what Jesus is talking about with Nathaniel there. Lots of people have sort of spilt lots of ink trying to work out what exactly Jesus is talking about. I think probably the point is we don't know because this is a personal thing to Nathaniel. And that's the point. Jesus knows Nathaniel at the depth of who he is, his character, his, his most sort of personal, deeply intimate things. And that seems to be why Nathaniel in verse 49 declares, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. As we encounter Jesus Christ, we find someone who, it turns out, 
knew us long before we ever really knew ourselves, knows all about us and knows us to the depth of our being. Now, on the face of it, that might sound quite discomforting. We, we live in an age where there's so much about us that seems to get out on the Internet. People seem to want to harvest all those things about us. And so lo lots of people are concerned about big tech, big data, us being spied upon, people getting their hands on information about us. And, well, who knows what they could do? I think we're rightly <laughs> concerned about the motives of people who have lots and lots of information about us. But what if there was someone who knew us like this, but also loved us to the core of who we are? I guess that's the fear, isn't it? With big tech, big data, whatever, knowing so much about us. We can't trust them with what they know. What Nathaniel experiences here is someone who knows him right to the core of who he is and yet who he can trust. In so many of our relationships, actually what we're trying to do is hide part of who we are because we fear if they really knew us, they wouldn't, they wouldn't want to know us anymore. In Les Miserables, Victor Hugo has a, one of his characters say, the supreme happiness of life consists in the conviction that one is loved. Love for one's own sake, let us say rather, loved in spite of oneself. Hugo almost, that character almost sort of gives away. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could be loved for who we are? But no, who we are, we wouldn't want people to know. So we want to be loved in spite of ourselves. What Nathaniel experiences is in Jesus Christ, someone who knows us, knows him to the very depth of his being and loves him. Someone who he can still follow. Someone who is still worth following. Because I guess here is someone who isn't going to use what he knows, is, knows against Nathaniel, but is only going to love and care for and bless Nathaniel as he follows him. That is getting to the very heart of what Christianity is all about. A God who knows all about us. A God who is infinitely beyond us and is, has such sovereign control and knowledge and understanding that we, we cannot even begin to imagine. And yet who wants to get to know us individually, personally, and who if we follow and if we put our lives into his hands, he will not abuse us. He, he will not crush us but will only lead us for our very best. Now, you might say, well, how is that possible? How, how, can you, how can that be anything other than a pipe dream? Well, that's the third thing I think that Nathaniel shows us. It, well, I suppose that, that the interaction between Jesus and Nathaniel shows us. The third thing about Jesus that makes him worth following is that he offers us a gift beyond our wildest imagining. So, the end of our story, Nathaniel declares to Jesus, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. What is the greater thing that Jesus offers Nathaniel at this point here? Well, it's basically... <laughs> that the picture at least is a ladder to heaven and a ladder that things are going up and coming down from in other words what jesus says he is all about is a connection between heaven and earth a way to heaven away from heaven we don't need to be estranged from god but we can get to know him we can have access to the that wonderful place of glory and beauty where god lives but here's what's really interesting about this picture that jesus speaks the greater thing that he offers to nathaniel jesus is in the picture but he's not at the top of the ladder if you like beckoning us up 
He's at the bottom, calling us to follow him. When you look around all the different sort of options, when you say to people, how can I get to know God? How can I get in touch with what is ultimate reality? How can I live the sort of life that is in accord with what ultimate reality is? What you find all over the place is a call basically to ascend a ladder. For some people, or for some ways of life, it might be through right morals. If I just live this certain way, then God will be pleased with me or karma will go with me. I'll be on the right side of history if I just live in the right way. For, for other belief systems, it might be just believe the right things. If I acknowledge the right truths, if I, if I, if I say I believe the right things, then life will work well. Or I might need to have the right attitude, the right posture. If I just adopt the right practices, then I'll know God. Then I'll be in tune with the universe. Here's all these ways in which we need to ascend the ladder. What Jesus Christ offers, what Jesus Christ invites us to, is a way of knowing God that <laughs> depends on Jesus coming down to us. It's the extraordinary truth at the very heart of what it means to be a Christian. Jesus really can say to us, follow me, because he has come down to our space and time reality. And he's done it, John wants us to see, to lead us back to be with God forever. Now, you see, that speaks for one thing about God's trustworthiness, Jesus's trustworthiness. Yes, he may be someone who knows all about us, who knows us better than we know ourselves. But he's also someone who has paid this enormous cost, who's been willing to step into our world to bless us. And as you read through John's gospel, you might well know where that stepping into our world leads us is to Jesus even laying down his life. That, in fact, is the very way that he opens up heaven to us now if jesus has done that much for us can you begin to see how he's someone we can trust he knows all about us but he also loves us to the very depths so much so that he was willing to come in and lay down his life for us can you also see why if that's true this is a jesus worth following worth encountering and responding to personally He's a Jesus who it's OK to step out of the crowd and to engage with personally. I recognize that's a, that's a sort of scary idea in itself. Many of us would much rather just st stick in the crowd and stay a sort of faceless name as we as we try and work out what Jesus is like. But what Jesus says to Nathaniel, I suppose he echoes to each one of us. As we engage with Jesus personally. We find he not only makes sense of our world right now, he not only knows us to the depth of who we are, but he offers us incredible blessing, the incredible blessing of being able to encounter God and meet him personally and be led by him through all that life brings one day to see him face to face because Jesus has come down to us. Well, in response to what we've read and thought about, it's right that we worship this God. And in our song that we're going to sing, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken, we hear basically the, the privilege of knowing this God and belonging to him. So let's sing our next hymn together, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken.
Our prayers of intercession are led for us this morning by our church warden, Joe Jordan. Let us remember the presence of God with us now and lift up our hearts to God the Father, to whom we pray, to God the Son, through whom we pray, and to God the Holy Spirit, in whom we pray. A prayer for this, the second Sunday of Epiphany, at which time we think of our personal ministry and we think of the diversity of gifts with which members of this, the parish of St. Bartholomew, have been blessed. Almighty Father, enable each one of us to exercise with diligence and cheerfulness the ministry we have received from you. But being bound together as a family of St. Bartholomew, we may use our gifts to serve your church and in particular this parish. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless, we beseech thee, the clergy of this parish, Nick, Charlie and Saskia, and Bishops David and Anne. Strengthen them with your heavenly grace that they may guide and support those of us who are committed to their care, particularly at this difficult time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we are faced with the current global coronavirus pandemic, we ask you, Father, to inspire the minds of all to whom you have committed the government of the nations of this world, and for those individuals charged with guiding those governments. Give them the vision of wisdom, truth, and justice, that by their counsels, all of us may work together in the brotherhood to find a solution to the current crisis. And we pray also that you will give solace and hope to all who currently are troubled physically or psychologically by this virus. And we thank you for guiding those who have developed the vaccines and pray that for the greater good, those who do not have a genuine medical reason for refusing it will be persuaded to change their minds. And we ask you to protect the many thousands who have volunteered to deliver the vaccination program. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Father, we pray that you will bless those who are attending the sick, protect them and their families, and keep them free from infection. We pray also for others whose work exposes them to coronavirus and whose contributions are nevertheless essential to the sustainability of our society. We think of carers, hospital porters, ambulance drivers, drivers of public transport, those who empty our dustbins, shop assistants, and many others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we in this parish ask for your guidance in solving the problems which face us both as individuals and as members of this congregation. We thank you that we are part of the fellowship of your universal church, we give thanks for the heritage of this church, St. Bartholomew, and for all who down the ages have worshipped here and who have served you by their work and witness. And we pray for the young people of our community, and we remember particularly the schools and other places of learning within our parish. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant, O oh Lord, your healing grace to all who are feeling pain, whether physical or mental pain. Give to them your spirit of peace and of hope, of courage and endurance. And we think especially at this time of all those known to us who are suffering. Give to them perfect confidence and trust that in you they may cast out the spirit of anxiety and fear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, hear us as we remember all those known to us who have died and we think of their families too. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is a great hymn of prayer and praise. Tell out my soul. wonderful way to end our service of worship to God together. We're really at the end uh, of this service. Just a couple of things to draw to your attention. Uh, the first is that uh, if you're new to our church or um, haven't yet signed up for our weekly updates, they're really the way to find out what's going on at the moment. You can look at our website, which is updated frequently. Uh, but details of uh, Zoom meetings and other things come to you through uh, the weekly email update. Uh, and you can also sign up to find out about uh, our uh, midweek prayer meetings. We have a meeting at 10.30 for morning prayer on Wednesday uh, and two uh, sessions for uh, open prayer at 12.30 on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So please do sign up. Uh, and also do like and subscribe, uh, like this video and subscribe to our channel. Uh, it really helps to uh, draw our church family to uh, the attention of others who may be looking uh, for spiritual sustenance during this very difficult time. Now, in what I can only assume is an attempt to climb up the 
uh, ladder to get closer to the top of the queue uh, for the coronavirus vaccine. Charlie Butler has arranged for it to be his birthday today. So please, if you happen to uh, see Charlie, which I suppose is quite unlikely, uh, but um, do uh, think of Charlie and his family today as they celebrate his birthday. Uh, Charlie, we're, we're um, so thrilled that you're part of our church family and uh, we wish we could be together uh, and celebrating with you uh, in person. Now, as we really do come to the end of the service, we're going to uh, say the grace. Please do join in at home uh, and say this together with me. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.